Hereby I open this academic ceremony in which Ming Li will defend the academic thesis, Economic Growth in the Face of Changes. May I invite you to present the summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Please take the floor. Thank you. Dear Prorector, dear members of the Defense Committee, dear friends, family, and colleagues, thank you all for joining my PhD defense today, on site or online. So I bought this dress three years ago for my defense, and finally I got the chance to wear it, and I'm very happy it still fits. <laughs> so I'm very happy today to be here to present my research about economic growth in the face of changes. So te technology brings a lot of changes into our lives. It changes the way how we work and how we live. For example, Automation in the manufacturing industry, it replaces a lot of manual workers and it makes production more productive. And another example is there are robots nowadays in the restaurants delivering our food and drinks. And the hottest topic recently is artificial intelligence. So actually the book cover of my thesis is based on AI generated image but I also did some work. So technology really uh, increases uh, productivity and therefore increase economic growth. And they make some, also make some jobs obsolete. Then unfortunately, not everyone can benefit from technology. So some workers will lose jobs. And then there, is ch there are changes in wages and employment. So technology, therefore, also can bring some inequality between individuals, industries, and countries. So technology will have a big impact on the labor market. So that's the focus of my research, changes in labor markets. To be more specific, changes in the labor market incur cost. So there are costs like hiring and firing cost, training cost, search costs, so if you want to look for a job, it needs time and effort. And then there are costs of moving, so if you want to change jobs, then probably you need to move to another city or even another country. Then those costs can in turn influence technological change. So there's a loop. So technology development brings labor market adjustment. And adjustment incur cost, and those costs in turn influence technological development. Then, therefore, it can also influence economic growth inequality, so some economic factors. So that's the main focus of my research. So what I'm interested in my uh, in my thesis are two aspects from uh, of adjustment cost. The first aspect is adjustment cost come from adapting to technological change. And there are changes because of technological change. So first is the changes in skill composition. So I, so I investigate the adjustment cost of changes in skill composition in chapter two. And then there's another change is inter-industry reallocation of skills. That's what I investigate in chapter three. And then the second aspect I look at into is the uh, adjustment cost come from labor market institutions. Labor market institutions include organizations, rules, regulations, and policies that protect employees. So for example, trade union, Trade union negotiate our wages with companies. So when inflation is high, like recently, so trade union can negotiate with the company to increase our wage more. But it can also, because of this, it can also have some adjustment cost because it can also make, um, make it really hard for companies to fire employees, for example. So my re main research question is, what is the impact of those adjustments cost on economic performance? 
so economic growth and inequality. Why is this question important? There are two aspects. So first aspect is for firms. So for firms, they want to catch up with the technology. So adjustment cost can influence how fast they can adapt to technologies. That's why it, it can influence firms' innovation. And then, because adjustment cost is a kind of cost, it can also reduce productivity and efficiency. And then it can also influence how firms invest in human capital. And the second aspect is for policy making. So policymakers want to increase economic growth and also want to reduce inequality. But adjustment cost can slow down economic growth and they may can also increase inequality. And that's why I want to investigate this, pro uh, this problem. And then for labor market policies, they want to take into account those adjustment costs to better design uh, better policies. So let's dive into the first aspect, adapt to technological change. So in economics, there's a term called skill-biased technical change. It means the type of te uh, technical change that increases the productivity and demand of high-skilled labor relatively to low-skilled labor. So for example, several manual workers can be replaced by a machine and the high-skilled labor who can operate the machine. So the, it can bring two changes. The first one is changes in skill conversation. So high-skilled labor will increase, will increase and low-skilled labor will decrease. And the second change will be inter-industry inter reallocation of skills. So high-skilled labor will move to high-tech industries. Then what is often ignored, what is the adjustment cost here? What I focus on is the cost of on-the-job learning. I have two hypotheses. So first one, different Skill levels have different on the job learning process. So they can have different adjustment costs. So for example, the cashier works in supermarket. The on the job learning for her would be learn how to operate the cash register. But for software engineer, he or she needs to learn to become the expert in certain program languages because different companies use different programming languages. And he or she also needs to learn how to make a software for specific users. And the second aspect is on the job learning is specific. Spe could be specific for jobs are specific for certain industries. So I have another example. So John is a car engineer in a traditional manu manufacturing company, and somehow he wants to switch careers and he wants to become a software engineer, and he will face uh, some challenges. For example, there's a skill gap. So the skill set he has as a car engineer is different from a software engineer. So he needs to learn programming languages, software development methodologies, and some other technical skills. And another uh, thing is he lacks industry experience and networks. So what this will cause the problem, right? So what's the problem? If workers with different skill levels have different costs on the, of the learning on the job, the first question, how does this affect productivity change and wage differences between high and low skill labor? And the second question is, 
does this play a role in which differences between industries? So I try to answer those two questions. And what I find in my uh, research, uh, the first finding is high skill labor has higher adjustment cost because of the learning on the job. And it has temporarily higher decreases in t productivity relatively to low skill labor. And the second finding is newly hired high skill workers are overcompensated because the, on the, the cost of under job learning is not taken into account. And the last finding is specific on the job learning increases in quality. So when the skills are specific to high tech industry, high skill workers have relatively higher wages in high tech industries than in the lower tech, low tech industries. And this will increase in quality. So another aspect is labor market institutions. Like I said before, labor market institutions protect wo workers. So it's more about policy making. Policy making often faces trade offs. So, what I'm interested in chapter four is the trade off between minimizing inflation and unemployment. Well, we all want low inflation and low unemployment, but there's a negative relationship between them. So inflation increases, unemployment decreases. So the reason behind this is, for example, when the economy is not doing well, and like during COVID, then the government wants to stimulate the economy. So they put more money on the market, firms have more money to invest in projects. So they need more workers to work. Then the unemployment will decrease. But then because everyone has more money, so they can buy more things and the price will go up. But what is more interesting is how labor market institutions would affect this trade-off. So what I have in mind is, so labor market institutions protect workers. It can negotiate with companies to increase our wages. But when, once our wages go up, it's not really easy to go down. So the adjustment, uh, it's harder. Then the problem is when wages are high, companies don't want to hire people anymore. So the unemployment maybe will be higher. So more protection means harder to adjust the labor market. And the findings from this chapter are first, there, we did find there's a negative relationship between inflation and unemployment. And we also find labor market institutions can affect this trade-off. And indeed, then we also find labor market institutions make it harder to fight unemployment. So based on those findings, I have several implications for policy making. So first, policymakers should support workers in getting new skills, especially on the job learning. And the second one is policymakers should provide support for skill upgrading for low skill workers, and especially for industries which need specific skills. And the last one is policymaking should focus or aim for high coordination and efficiency in labor market institu institutions. That is the short summary of my research. Thank you very much. I would like to give the, sp the stage to the Rector. Thank you for your presentation. The opposition will be opened by Dr. Stratmans. Dr. Stratmans is an Associate Professor of Banking and Finance at Maastricht University. Floor is yours. 
Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Dear Ming, so I very much enjoyed reading your thesis. First of all, and let me do also be the first to congratulate you with this piece of work, <laughs> which I think is a very nice balance between uh, economic theory and empirics. And you indeed show, I think, a good level of proficiency in both empirical techniques, but also on developing theory and deriving theoretical results. And uh, I also very much liked the fact that you apply stochastic frontier analysis to empirical microeconomic problems which is yeah, unseen, I think, which is uh, really novel. And to point, for example, where countries can improve their inflation and employment trade-off. But of course, I was also asked to make your life not that easy today. And um, there is, of course, sufficient food for thought to talk about. Mm. Now, my first question goes back to your second chapter on, on skill-biased technical change. Mm -hmm. And it is also something that I pointed out, I think, in my report that I sent you previously. Now, technical change, uh, and you, you also call it with this adjective, uh, uh, skill biased, is typically, most of the time, you say, uh, favoring high skilled labor relative to low skilled labor. And that is inter alia reflected in more relative demand for high skilled labor, higher wage premia, it induces more income inequality, etc., with all the policy issues that, that follow. So that makes intuitive sense. However, correct me if I'm wrong, but you also seem to suggest at the start of the thesis on page three that this is not always necessarily the case with technical change, and that I was a bit intrigued by that. And so you write on page three, more often than not, technical change is skilled biased. Okay, so more often than not, but not always. <laughs> so could you, could you elaborate on that quote a bit? Uh, that is the first part of my question. So maybe you can give examples from economic history where actually uh, there is no skill biased effect of technical change. And, and related to that, and that is the more speculative part of my question, um, I would like you to contemplate a little bit about the impact of specific technical shocks to employment in sectors. For example, the financial sector, uh, where we have the fintech and digitalization uh, wave uh, the last couple of years or maybe the last decade already. So is this, is this really there also a skill biased form of technical change or is it more that all levels of employment are equally affected both at the branches where you have low skilled people to some extent but also more uh, advanced investment advice jobs that are taken over by robo advice. So is that not more or less homogeneous that effect? I'm curious hearing your thoughts on this. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Dear uh, esteemed opponent, thank you for your questions, thank you for your comment. Uh, I'm not really sure that I get the second question, but I, uh, I will try to answer the first question first. So the first question, like uh, skill, the skill bias technique change is uh, not always the case. So um, I think it also depends on uh, different sectors, right? So when the um, high-tech uh, industries, for example, so when there's a skill bias technique, there's a technology shock, and definitely we will see um, like the productivity of high skill labor will increase faster than low skill labor. But I mean, relatively, the, the, the share of low skill labor is also low in that kind of industries. And, but for some, um, for some, s s some industries, I think uh, the productivity increase for high skill labor could be let's say, um, not, not that obvious because the, I think it's based on the uh, intensity of the high skill labor. So for example, so based on uh, the data set I had in, my, uh, in chapter two, so th there are certain uh, industries I observe that the skill composition doesn't really change that much. And maybe technology can replace, let's say, uh, some skill, low skill laborers. And, but 
they also don't need much high skill labor in that industry. So sometimes we, we probably cannot observe skill bias technique change in certain industries. Yep. Then the second question. Um, yeah, can you elaborate a little Sorry. bit more? Uh, <laughs> so you have the financial sector, you have the, the uh, technological, yeah. technical change going on there also huh, called fintech digitalization. Now, nowadays we talk about open AI that you also referred to and that might also impact the financial sector, but all other sectors. Yeah. So that example of fintech digitalization on the one hand, but also open AI, for example, do you expect there also a skill biased? Is that a skill biased technical change? Uh, because I can imagine, as, a, as the example I gave with financial services, that yeah. also high also high skilled people lose their jobs uh, because they, the, the investment advisors are replaced by uh, machine learning algorithms. Uh, so why would there be a skill biased technical change necessarily in that sector? Maybe, maybe yes, I don't know. And the same with open AI. So which types of jobs are more vulnerable than others? Yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> yes, for fa financial se uh, sector, yes. Um, I think, well, nowadays there's uh, artificial intelligence, so machine learning, there's a big, big uh, discussion about this. So people would say some like financial analysis can be replaced by machine learning, so they can create like um, investing strategies based on algorithms, so they don't really need people, need traders anymore, for example. But then they could also create more uh, other kind of work uh, works in this industry, right? So they need people who can create this algorithm. And they are still uh, high skill labor and they just, so to say, they maybe need more people, need skills which can, uh, like skills uh, more about uh, quantitative computing, for example. But it can also f have some skill bias technique change there, for example, so bank tellers, they are more or less be replaced by you know, online banking and you don't really need to go to the bank anymore to withdraw money or in deposit money, right? And you don't need to transfer uh, through banks and you just do it online and also influence lower skilled laborers. So that is my answer. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Professor Asmild, who holds a chair in Applied Industrial Economics at the University of Copenhagen. Thank you, Pro-Rector. Uh, dear candidate, uh, thank you very much for your dissertation. I've really enjoyed reading it. Um, you have covered a lot of ground, both theoretically, but also with, with empirical applications. And I think uh, the topic is very relevant and topical, as you've also uh, explained well in your presentation today. Um, so you have done a lot of things, but my question relates to the things you have not done. <laughs> yes. So basically, uh, I'm interested in your justifications for the modeling approaches you have chosen. So mm -hmm. maybe especially chapter two and four. Mm -hmm. So you have chosen a certain technique, for example, stochastic frontier analysis, yeah. but you're not discussing why you chose that instead of an alternative. And also within uh, that modeling approach or that line of thinking, there are lots of choices to be made, functional form, uh, so specification of your uh, parametric relationship, choice of inefficiency distribution, things like that, mm -hmm. that you're not really discussing, uh, and you're not, and I have not seen any investigation of the sensitivity of your results to those uh, assumptions. Uh, so maybe you can sort of elaborate on that. I look forward to your answer. Thank you. Dear highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your comments. Thank you for your question. Uh, I think that's a very good question. Uh, but before answering it, I have to admit, like, especially for my first paper, I actually have done a lot of different kind of functions, tried different functions, and uh, I actually changed that paper three times. <laughs> At the beginning, it's uh, 
not the methodology I wrote in my final version. And I did try different uh, production frontiers. So for example, the true ex uh, effect, um, a fixed effect model and uh, some um, some other models, but um, but it, it in, initially because that paper is developed based on my research master thesis, and in my research master thesis I actually compare different models, <laughs> yes, and but then uh, afterwards I think I focus more on the economic theory part. And I really think the model I chose eventually can all really explain uh, the economic model I have. And because uh, there's a omitted variable bias. And that model I use that uh, can actually distinct, uh, dis distinguish the technical skill bias, technical change, and efficiency change. So that's why I cho uh, chose that model. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Charlie, who is a senior researcher in the field of economics of, edu of innovation at uh, the Maastricht University. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. And um, thank you very much, Ming. Um, it was a very interesting thesis, indeed. Um, Friday will be lots of pleasure and uh, lots of interest. <clears throat> and uh, let me come from um, my, my own experience in looking at technological change, in particular in relation to labor markets. Mm -hmm. um, and let me start from one of your um, replies, uh, which, uh, which just said to the previous opponent about the, the example of bank tellers. Yeah. Now, bank tellers are a very good example of mid-skilled workers. They're not low-skilled and they're not high-skilled. And um, in, at least in the literature. So <clears throat> the literature um, on employment and technical change has uh, discussed a lot how what uh, technology changes is not skills but tasks. So they really um, uh, try to understand how as tasks become codified, so the knowledge to do tasks become codified, such as, for example, uh, counting money, such as, for example, organizing money uh, in, a, in a bank, Mm -hmm. uh, as these become codified, then uh, you can develop technologies which uh, automate those tasks. And then when you automate those tasks, then you can replace the workers. Yeah. Now, technology has changed a lot um, since uh, the, 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 you know, the, in, in, in the past uh, century, from automating tasks which are very low skilled to automating tasks which are middle skilled and nowadays high skilled. Um, <clears throat> workers which are, so so what the the evidence really show is that um, the uh, workers that have been losing particularly in the last couple of uh, last couple of decades are the mid skilled workers those have reduced wages and have reduced employment mm -hmm. um, so my question is where are the mid skilled workers in your story in the in the in the second uh, chapter and how do the results of the chapter uh, of, of the of the chapter would change if you consider the mid-skilled workers and how do your results relate to the fact that those who are losing wages and employment are not the high skilled or the low skilled but the mid-skilled mm -hmm. dear esteemed opponents thank you for your comment and uh, thank you for your question. I think that's a very, very good question. That's very relevant. And I have been thinking about this also for some time. And I have results in my uh, chapter that I have been thinking, oh, what's wrong with middle skill livers, you know? <laughs> and uh, related to that, I think, yeah, nowadays, like, there's also research about ta uh, routine a task the skill of uh, bias te technique change. And uh, yeah, that's the, also there's uh, research about uh, job polarizations. So which means median skill, uh, me me median skill labor decreases and both high and low skill workers uh, increases. So my thoughts about this is, well, I mean, skill, let, let, I have to admit, like, only to use skills to 
you know, measure laborers like based on their education, high, medium, low skills, doesn't really like uh, can, how to say, say that, see, see all the effects based on the job changes. Because let's say median skilled workers can also do low skill work, right? If they lose jobs, they can also like become a waiter at a restaurant or something. So that's why like the, this effect, of course, like we, we, we can, in my chapter two, I cannot ob really observe those, uh, so to say, the job transitions. And I would say based on tasks, Median skills the labor would do some more routine tasks. That 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 uh, indeed true. And then this part can really be automated. But I also think so. All the jobs have certain parts which can be automated. So they have like n not all the jobs can be replaced by computer, but they all kind of have some parts can be replaced by computer, even high skill labor, right? So artificial intelligence can replace some routine works for high skill labor too. But it also, I mean, high skill labor, it <laughs> for example, like me, I consider myself high skill labor. I also have other skills rather than that. But I know uh, for high skill labor, they also have some skills like to operate computers. So that's why like for them, maybe that's not a big problem. And for middle skill laborers, maybe, okay, they can be repla replaced and can be um, certain, let's say, I don't think they can be completely replaced. Some tasks of their job can be replaced. <laughs> and I think, well, then, like I said, they can also move to other sectors or move to other jobs, but we, which may influence the result I have in chapter two. But I, based on the data I had, I can not really, uh, how to say that, uh, distinguish the effect. So there's a compound effect in, in, in the estimation. I hope I answer your question. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Parmeter, who joins us online from Miami, where it's now, I think, 4.30 in the morning, so we appreciate uh, a lot. Um, Dr. Parmeter uh, is a researcher on efficiency and productivity analysis at the University of Miami. Please go ahead. Thank you, Director. Uh, thank you, Ming. Um, hope everyone can hear me. Uh, the question I have for you, Ming, is you know, to, it's, it's, it's sometimes it can be very challenging to identify uh, skill bias, technical change, because there's so much wrapped up in uh, all the assumptions that we have to make. And you've done a very good job of laying this out in your chapter two. But one thing that I, I thought was missing a little bit, and I was hoping you could speak to it, is the types of assumptions that you're making that help you to disentangle productivity shocks from the types of technology shocks that you need uh, to be able to sort of assess whether or not particular uh, change in technology is skill biased towards or against a particular form of labor. Uh, you know, uh, kind of in the mold of the, the, the recent uh, sort of proxy variable um, uh, literature that shows up that deals with um, sort of uh, capital and labor being endogenous because firms and sectors know about uh, productivity advances coming down the pipeline and then adapting those. And then of course you're looking at data X, X post. So I was hoping you could comment a little bit on that. <laughs> Dear esteemed opponent, I'm sorry I didn't really understand your question. Can you repeat? <laughs> sure. Uh, so if you if you think of the in your chapter two, think of a situation where a lot of firms know about let's say uh, Chat GPT, OpenAI coming in advance of when it actually sort of hits when it it might be in the data, and so there could be changes in let's say labor or capital in the short term 
that are reflected in your data that the firms are adapting to these known to them productivity shocks, but they're unknown to the econometrician, the person looking at the data. And so what this is gonna do is gonna lead to various types of endogeneity effects. And then when you go to identify or you go to estimate your technology, this is gonna cause econometric biases in the things that you're estimating. And so you need particular assumptions about how to disentangle those two effects so that you can then get at looking at what's going on in, in particular to um, uh, the types of skill biases that you want to pick up in terms of you know, you're looking at your marginal effects, let's say, between changes in the, 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 the marginal rates of, uh, of payment towards, let's say, low workers versus uh, 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 low skilled workers versus high skilled workers. I'm not sure that I understand the question completely. So what you mean is uh, there's an endogenous problem in the estimation, is it correct? Yes. Yes, uh, but that's the pr problem I try, I try to solve. But the, the thing is I'm not looking at, uh, uh, so to say, causal effects, right? So I want to look at uh, the relationship. So I just want to see whether there's an uh, effect from changes in skill compensations. So um, because it's a, uh, how to say that? It, it, in my presentation, right? So there's a loop. So the technology change induced adjustment, adjustment induced cost and cost induced uh, that then influence techni uh, technical change again. So it's hard to really see which cause which. So that's why like, I only want to investigate the uh, relationship, so to say. Got gotcha. you. So in this case, since you're not identifying causal effects, is it the... Uh, is, do you have concern that the, the numbers that you're getting could be, let's say, too large or too small in one direction, which could then have sort of feedback effects in terms of the types of policies that you're advocating for? <laughs> Sorry, uh, I, I didn't uh, understand the question. Sorry. Uh... Right, so... You, you don't want causal effects, that's okay. But in this case, when you're just trying to pick up associations in the data, there's still going to be sort of missing something. Uh, that always happens when you uh, don't sort of try to identify causal effects. So in this case, the numbers that you're looking at, let's say they could be slightly too large, slightly too small, those could then shade towards one type of policy recommendation versus another. I'm just wondering if you have any sort of ideas to is your skill bias measure for, let's say, high skill too high, too small? Thank you for your question, yes. Uh, I have to admit that, yeah, uh, I mean, they, there could be other factors which influence uh, skill bias technique change, but we, which we, I don't re, uh, include in the estimation, but um, that, my main focus is to look at the changes in skill by uh, skill, skill compositions. And then um, I try to add as like many like fixed effect to control differences between countries and industries. And I wish that can, you know, catch some other effects, but um, I, I cannot say Come like one hundred percent that uh, all other factors cannot cannot influence the result. Yeah, that's my that's my answer. Yeah, I th I think we'll uh, in the interest of uh, time we also will have to postpone the further discussion on this issue till after the defense and uh, the con the opposition will be continued by Professor Sanders who is a professor professor of international economics at Maastricht University. 
Thank you, Mr. Prorector, and thank you, dear Ming, for, um, for a very nice uh, thesis. I enjoyed reading it, and uh, I want to join my colleagues in congratulating you on a well-balanced, interesting, and well-written PhD thesis. I was also enjoying the previous exchange, but we'll see if we can get back to that. Um, the chapters that you present are pushing the academic frontiers and on topics that are very dear to my heart. It's about 20 years ago that in this very same room I defended my own PhD thesis entitled Skill Bias Technical Change. So I'm supposed to know something about it, but I've abandoned that field a little bit. Uh, nonetheless, it's really good to see that the finance department at our faculty is diversifying <laughs> into very important macroeconomic and labor economics questions. Um, but to my question, um, I had a few, but uh, let me focus on chapter three and, and maybe change the focus of the defense also a little bit. So you, it, it, it relates to the, the exchanges we've had. You've assumed technology to be rather exogenous in your models and estimations. It is, let's say, it falls almost like manna from heaven and is, uh, well, happening, happening to the firms, it's happening to the workers. And then you start talking about uh, the adjustment process and, and how that could be facilitated and improved. And in your policy responses, as well as in your, um, also in the modeling choices you make, a lot of the burden of that adjustment is put on the workers. And I was just wondering if I go, let's see, let me see because I'm improvising here. So um, if, if you make it concrete, if, if your job is automated in the car industry, you, you suggest that you might become a bookkeeper or you could switch to personal services. Or, uh, but perhaps if, if technology is not exogenous, if technology does not fall like manna from heaven, but is the result of profit maximizing uh, choices made in R&D labs, um, that there, there could also be technologies in the next round that would be developed that would help you again uh, improve and remain in the, in the job that you are. So then adjustment and mobility become kind of a risky decision and an investment that you would make that all of a sudden, you know, next round could, be, could again be invalidated. So for these workers, if you put yourself in their shoes, mm -hmm. what would that mean? Um, you know, you, you're suggesting that they should make their, their skill, if I read it correctly, that they should make their skills less specific, that they should invest more in their, uh, uh, let's say, mobility and human capital that is transferable across jobs. Mm -hmm. You insist, you insist, no, you suggest reducing their bargaining power, and all that makes it easier for firms to adopt whatever technology comes about and mm -hmm. fit their labor force to that technology. But is the worker there to make the life of the firm easy, or should should firms also take a part of the responsibility and develop technologies, interfaces on technologies, so that their workers can keep working in the, developing their jobs and, and developing their, uh, their careers? And if, it, if, if you take that perspective, should you not then argue for, well, very different policy implications? Uh, I think I'll leave it there and let you reflect on those issues. Dear highly esteemed opponents, thank you for your comments. Thank you for your question. Actually, I think this is a very interesting question. Uh, yeah, I haven't thought about uh, that part, but let me first uh, illustrate a little bit why I come from the worker per perspective, so to say. So this whole research idea actually came from uh, the question I had when I was a bachelor student. So what I had in mind is that, okay, should I go higher education or should I want to start working early and accumulate working experience? Then, uh, I don't know why, but I ended up doing a PhD. <laughs> so that's why like, I think this is the main interest that I have uh, when I did my research. And so that's why like, I think a lot about this. And let me interpret my research a little bit uh, in a different way. So what I have in mind is skill bias, bias technique change actually is the interaction between technology and general skill. So I consider like education is more like general skill. And then the, on, the learning, uh, on the job learning part, 
So what I interpreted, uh, interpret is the interaction between technology and specific skill. So that's why I said it's adjustment cost if there's a techno uh, technological change and it, you may lose your specific skill, then it's a cost. And especially for workers who works in very specific industries. And actually this happens um, in high tech uh, industries, right? So they also need to constantly study new technologies, if there's a new software, a new programming language, they need to continuously study. So there's a continuous on the job learning. And then, you know, the work experience that they had before, they could lose some productivity or, you know, efficiency because of that. So that's the main idea behind my research. And of course, firms want to invest in technology and well, from firm perspective, and especially in high tech industries, they don't really care about, well, yeah, those workers, they don't have the skill anymore. So what happened is that they fire workers maybe when they are like 40, 50s, and they, their uh, skills become obsolete. And then they just hire new uh, workers who have these skills. And there's actually, uh, uh, there's a research uh, paper about this, and they said like in high tech industries, like workers have uh, higher wages at the entrance level, and their wage, uh, uh, like the age versus wage relationship goes flat afterwards. So that's, uh, that's the thing. But that's why there, I had a third chapter, actually. Uh, the, the, not the third chapter, sorry. The four, fourth chapter, so the third paper, like about in, uh, labor, insti uh, labor market institutions. So if, let's say, it is really hard to fire a person, to fire your workers, and then the only thing you can do is better to invest on the job learning and you know, how, uh, make your uh, workers you have to learn more new technologies. That's if I may, Mr. Prorector, yeah? briefly. Um, yeah. Yes, but I, I would like to push you a little bit to try and turn this on its head because you could also prevent the problem Mm -hmm. by preventing skill bias technical change, by creating markets, making it profitable for firms to develop technologies that allow workers to stay in their job without all that training and all those mobility costs. Because we can use technology in different ways. Uh, you can use it to, uh, of course, you can say, okay, your skills are now obsolete, so I fire you and uh, I hire a new batch of fresh highly skilled people and they can uh, now operate the new technology and I care about my profits and that's why I do this. Yeah. Or is there also, a, let's say, a stakeholder model, a responsibility for firms as a community to also take care of their workers once they reach 40 and develop technologies that help them do a useful set of tasks in the firm that they're employed at? Is, and, and, and why would you choose that, let's say, harsh neoliberal capitalist perspective. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Yes. Well, mm, <laughs> I totally agree that uh, it will be very good if firms can do that. <laughs> if they really can develop technology to help old uh, workers to really function and increase their productivity more. But um, Mm. Well, by forcing the firms to keep them on the payroll, so reducing the flexibility, you would kind of give them an incentive to do so. Yeah, but then you also need to invest in on job learning, right? So then you invest in on the job learning, then can learn because you cannot fire them. And uh, I think, well, there's another problem. Like I said in the uh, chapter four, so if you really keep them, so you keep them even their productivity is low, and you try to like invent a technology to increase their productivity, uh, so on, so on, and 
then probably let's say there's a worker with five year uh, exp working experience and his skill become obsolete. So five year work, maybe, I mean, the productivity based on that probably decrease. And then you still have to pay this worker for their five year experience. You cannot pay this person as the entry level, like the, the person who just graduated from school. Then the then the company needs to pay for the for the for the gap. Yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> As an attentive audience, you have noticed now that uh, we have completed uh, the first round of opposition, but luckily there is some time left for a second round. And the first question in that second round will be asked by Professor Asmild. Thank you. Uh, so I'll change sort of tack a little bit here and go very specific. Okay. Um, so figure 2.6 and figure 2.11. So you're on page 37 and 42. You are fitting some relationships uh, based on empirical data. Yeah. Any reflections on those relationships, specifically 2.6 panel A and then both fig uh, figures in 2.11? Because to me, it looks like remove one extreme outlier and you have absolutely no pattern in your data. A uh, dear highly esteemed opponent, uh, which graph you mean? The 26A? 26A, yeah. And then 211. 211. Eleven on page forty-two. You mean? Yeah. So two six A is on page thirty-seven, and the other one on forty-two. And dear Halle, esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your question. Uh, I'm sorry, I, uh, I, I, I don't think I fully get your question, okay, but... Okay. So uh, in 26A, there's one point far right in that graph, right? 2.8. 26, two six, figure 26, the left one. The left one, yeah. If you remove the one point at the far right, mm -hmm. do you have any relationship between the two variables you're plotting? Ah, uh, so you mean if I move uh, remove M. M. Yeah, yeah. That seems to be an outlier here, right? So you're talking about a weak pos positive relationship, but. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But, uh, oh, well, that's a good question, but so to see, so for actually for this. Uh, graph uh, more focus on uh, graph 2.6b. Okay, so then go to 2.11 instead. <laughs> yeah, 2.11. So the 2.11, uh, because it's the um, average, annual average efficiency. So it's cross different industry, and uh, so it's the average of different industry and countries. Mm -hmm. So again, you have an outlier on the left. Remove that one. What have you got? Uh, remove that one. But this, this is, so to say, it's the average. If I will, like make it, so it's it, just to make it easier to see. If I want to really uh, look at it, I would make it like the graph based on all the industry and all the uh, countries. But it's just dangerous putting a trend line in there. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I yeah that that I agree. Maybe it's the outlier, but I need to like really uh, look into that. Like why there's one uh, that's different than <laughs> others. Yeah. Thank you. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Stratmans. I have a second question for you, and that goes back to chapter four. 
where you build a global best practice frontier that describes the optim optimal attainable combinations of low unemployment and inflation. So, and you separate the optimal trade-off between maintaining low inflation and low unemployment from suboptimal, inefficient drifts from the best practice frontier. And you relate these inefficiencies to country-specific labor market frictions. And you also study then how countries are able, uh, by labor market policies, by more labor, labor market flexibility, for example, to come closer to the best practice frontier. So far, so good. Now, however, uh, the, the Phillips curve is, of course, also about reducing inflation. That's one of the two variables on the axis, right? So, and that is, of course, the central bank who has the mandate for doing that. And I was simply wondering while reading why you didn't also consider, uh, let's say, the, 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 the quality, so to speak, of monetary policy or the monetary policy framework. For example, how dependent or independent the central bank is from, from the government. It might that be a factor that also impacts the positioning of the points below the best practice frontier? Dear esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your question. Uh, I have to admit that uh, I really didn't uh, consider that, but I do think that, you know, that how independent the central bank uh, is from the government can influence policy making. And that, I mean, so to say that different policy makers also have different preference for policies, right? So some policies would focus more on inflation, some policies would focus more on unemployment. So that can really influence the choice they make uh, on the policy making, so to say the trade-off between inflation and unemployment. Uh, but for that part, uh, well, there could be influence, let's say, monetary uh, policies, and also could influence labor market policies. That's why in that chapter, I specifically focus on labor market policies, but I wouldn't uh, say that uh, like monetary uh, policies or other policies would, wouldn't influence this. Yeah, that, that's my answer. Okay. The opposition will be continued by Dr. Charlie. Thank you, Director. And um, I'd, I'd love to go, go on with the discussion on, on tasks and, and routines, <laughs> but let me change a little bit the, the subject. Um, <clears throat> still on, on the second chapter. Mm -hmm. um, now, in the modeling, you make this assumption that um, you can analyze the, the, the dynamics between uh, skills and, um, and, and technology and wages at the industry level, because this is the data that you have. So you specify the model at the micro level, thinking mm -hmm. about what firms would do, and then you take a, 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 a representative firm and move the analysis at the industry level. Now, uh, let me come back to here as my background in, in uh, evolutionary economics, where um, if you look at the distribution of firm productivity, which is one of your main variables here, it's extremely skewed within industries and across industries. So you have very few superstar firms with very high productivity and the high mass of firms that have very low productivity. Yeah. Now, this means that when you aggregate at the industry level, everything you're doing is taking the productivity of very few firms, which is what will determine what happens at the industry level, which, which will determine the average. So that will be your representative firm. But your representative firm, in reality, is the, is the mass, which is the one with very low productivity. So in aggregating from firm level to industry level, how do you take this skewness of the distribution into account? Well, uh, dear esteemed opponent, I think that's a, a very relevant question. And indeed, in, my, uh, in chapter two, I did model based on a uh, firm's level. And then the data I had is industry level. And it, can, uh, it does influence, because I estimate the average effect, then it, does, it will make, uh, 
have an impact on the estimation. And I have to admit that uh, it could influence the result, but um, well, I try to add the industry fix effect. So I hope that can catch it, but uh, let's see. Uh, to answer that question, uh, actually, uh, <laughs> there's a paper uh, from my supervisor and uh, Professor Mark Sanders uh, about uh, R&D uh, life circle. So that paper actually says so more mature industries does have higher productivity, and but their efficiency change is low. What? Oh, uh, let me finish it briefly. So, <laughs> no? Okay. Ming Li, uh, <laughs> I have to apologize, but the time appointed for defending the thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. The meeting is adjourned. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because fate decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose that branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep park because we're taking off Take the mileage,
waste all your time Cause I'll go, I'll go, I'll go the extra mile
I reopen the session. Ming Li, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict, and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Your supervisor, Professor Boss, is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor now to take the floor. You want the Dutch or English version, Ming? English, please. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> First, there's an official part where you play a role, your last role for today. So, um, do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integ integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Ming Li, the degree of doctor and grant you all the rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affixed with the official seal of the university. Uh, you know, the laudatio is, uh, is the same age as your dress, three years, right? So <laughs> I, I had some time to think about this. <laughs> um, uh, Anna, I hear Anna laughing. She's one who understands best uh, your, uh, the trajectory that you went to because she went exactly to the same trajectory. I don't know if she ever told you, but um, I, I, I will remind her of sessions at Coffee Lovers where Paolo and I sat next to her, forcing her to finish her dissertation. So... <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, for the audience, so uh, I want you to sort of imagine something uh, for, uh, for a second. Uh, follow me on a, on a scenario. So imagine that you are a bit nervous and you're standing in a, in a room in, uh, in London and you're getting ready to give a, pres uh, a presentation at a quite prestigious uh, conference. And you've been explained the difference between a plenary talk and a talk in a session and you're happy because your talk is only in a session. And then you enter the room, and it turns out that the room is packed. It's so packed, in fact, that your supervisor is also there, has to stand in the back against the wall, together with a bunch of other people, um, because everybody's really, really curious about what you're going to present. And so um, you look at the audience, and in the front row are all these famous people who you quote in your paper, and that makes you even more uh, nervous. Um, and then it's your time to, uh, to present, so you get up there, and you feel a little bit small. And uh, then you start your presentation and a certain passion takes over. And you basically hit it out of the ballpark and you give a fantastic presentation. Actually, um, uh, Chris Parmiter referred to it uh, uh, earlier uh, uh, today. Um, but in fact, what you've just presented is your master thesis, your research master thesis. And uh, afterwards, your supervisor gets questions, who is this new assistant professor that Maastricht has hired? And he has to explain that it's not a new assistant professor, it's only first year PhD student who is about to basically start the PhD journey. So you glow, you're very happy, you spend a few extra days in, uh, in, in, in London, you imagine how proud your parents are. It sounds like a dream, right? Um, and it is, but also it kind of isn't. Because it's kind of like the story about the person who climbed up a hill and came down a mountain. Um, a start of your research career like that can be actually a little bit daunting. And if you don't watch it, what started as a blessing can be a little bit of a curse. So at first you're not aware of it, and neither are your supervisors, but slowly but surely this sort of Pinocchio effect starts creeping in. And before you know it, you start doubting your own skills, pun intended, and, uh, and ideas. That could have been your story. But the fact that you're standing here with a PhD degree um, 
is proof that it's only part of your story. So why is that? Like I said, I had a bit of time to, uh, to think about that. Um, and I think there are two main reasons why it's only part of the story. And the first reason is that you are actually a very good economist. And that sounds obvious for somebody who's getting a PhD from the School of Business and Economics, but I don't think it necessarily is. Uh, often nowadays, PhD is mainly about sort of the technical skills, data management, uh, maybe a little bit of oppor opportunism, uh, uh, networking. Um, and I think it's very refreshing and hope-inspiring and comforting to see that you can actually also still be an economist who can broadly think about uh, not just your own, uh, your own topic. So I ha I'm happy with that, I'm proud of that, and I hope you take it forward also in your job as a model validator, because I think in the financial sector they can use also people with that kind of perspective. The second reason I think why the beginning of the story is only the part of the story is what we call passion. So you and I have had many conversations, and you refer to it in your very nice, thank you, uh, acknowledgements about sort of the pros and cons of an academic career and doubts about, uh, ab about the process. But what we never really had arguments or conversations about was the topics and, and the content of the work itself, because there you were very convinced, intrinsically motivated. Um, and uh, I think it's this passion that has brought you this far. Um, and I think it's a passion that also, if you keep using it, will bring you much, much uh, further. Um, uh, one of the other quotes besides the one that you use in the acknowledgements that I often told you is that options are not costless. I mean, after all, even with this dissertation, you did get a PhD in the finance department. Um, and so in a sense, now you have a long call, um, the price of which is a sunk cost. There's your economics for you. Yeah. Um, and so what you should do is keep that PhD in your back pocket. Nobody can ever take it away from you and, and enjoy all the upside that the PhD can bring you. Uh, it's very well deserved, and I want to sincerely congratulate you on behalf of Pierre and, uh, and myself on a, on a job well done. Congratulations, Ming. Thank you. Dear Dr. Lee, also on behalf of the Maastricht University, I congratulate you with the degree you've acquired. And hereby, I close the session. Sorry that you get up so early. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. See you in a week. Bye. 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 Bye.